going to take more time. Like, what you going to have right now? I might have to take like one day a week or something. Maybe one day a month. But then I really can't do that for real. Because I don't even know what my title is going to be. So, can't really do that. I just keep snapping the pictures. <sighs> Today's March the first. Like, I knew that already, but. Every time I said I'm like, oh my God. Okay. Here we go. Beautiful people. Time for the day. Time for the day. Putting all my stuff together here. So we get started in two minutes. Josiah, shalom, shalom. Go ahead and open up my website for reading and pull up this shimmer here. Joshua one. All right, y'all. I moved some notes by myself because I didn't see it. All right, y'all. Wholeness, wholeness. All right, beautiful people, Betswabu, Betswabu, a great rising, wholeness, shalom, sawubona. All right, y'all, it is Monday, March the 1st, 2021, day 90 of year three of reading through the books of the law and the prophets and of the three year consecutive day count, day 759, and that is without the Sabbath days or the feast day, Sabbath days to add it in. Today, we start in the book of Joshua, so we're reading Joshua. One, two, and three. Then we're going to hop on over here to the legends of the Jews. So let's go ahead and get started today. Yahuwah's charge to Joshua. After the death of Moses, Yahuwah's servant, Yahuwah spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. Ah, hold on. I know I got started too quick. Shema. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with you, that you may increase mightily as Yahuwah, the God of our fathers, has promised us in the land that flows with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, Yahuwah, our God, he is one God, and you shall love Yahuwah, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words, which I command you this day, shall be in your heart. And you shall teach them diligently unto your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way. And when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the posts of your house and on your gates. And Yahuwah commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear Yahuwah our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And this shall be our righteousness if 
we observe to do all these commandments before you who are God as he has promised us. Shalom, shalom, mom. Okay. Joshua chapter one. <laughs> After the death of Moses, <clears throat> Yahuwah's servant, Yahuwah spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. I will promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set foot, you will be on uh, wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have given you. From the Negev wilderness in the south up in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north. From the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. For I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, from either to the left or to the right. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all that you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For you who your God is with you wherever you go. Greetings, greetings. Joshua then commanded the officers of Israel, go through the camp and tell the people to get their provisions ready. In three days, you will cross the Jordan River and take possession of the land Yahuwah, your God, has given you. Then Joshua called together the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. He told them, remember what Moses, the servant of Yahuwah, commanded you. Yahuwah, your God, has given you a place of rest. He has given you this land. Your wives, children, and livestock may remain here in the land Moses assigned to you on the east side of the Jordan River. But your strong warriors, fully armed, must lead the other tribes across the Jordan to help them conquer their territory. Stay with them until Yahuwah gives them rest, as he has given you rest, and until they, too, possess the land Yahuwah, your God, is giving them. Only then may you return and settle here on the east side of the Jordan River in the land that Moses, the servant of Yahuwah, assigned to you. So we know a portion of them. They said, well, you know, we got a whole bunch of folk. We don't need to go in over there. Let us just stay here. Let us keep this possession. And after Yahuwah consulted Moses, he allowed them to keep that portion of the land that was right outside of the promised land. But every time those who were on the inside of the promised land was going up to war, they also had to join. They answered Joshua, we will do whatever you command us and we will go where, wherever you send us. We will obey you just as we obeyed Moses and may you who are your God be with you as he was with Moses. Anyone who rebels against your orders and does not obey your words and everything you command will be put to death. So be strong and courageous. Good morning, LeBron. Joshua chapter two, Rohab, Rohab, Rahab protects the spies. Then Joshua secretly sent out two spies from the Israelite camp at Acacia Grove. He instructed them, scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan River, especially around Jericho. So the two men set out and came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there that night. But someone told the king of Jericho, some Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab. Bring out the men who have come into your house, for they have come here to spy out the whole land. Rahab had hidden the two men, but she replied, Yes, the men were here earlier, but I didn't know where they were from. They left the town at dusk as the gates were about to close. I don't know where they went. If you hear it, you can probably catch up with them. Actually, she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them beneath bundles of flax seeds she had laid out. So the king's men were looking for the spies along the road leading to the shallow crossings of the Jordan River. As soon as the king's men had left, the gate of Jericho was shut. Before the spies went to sleep that night, 
Rahab went up to the roof to talk to them. I know you who has given you this land, she told them. We are all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror. For we have heard how Yahuwah made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. And we know what you did to Sihon and all, and the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. For Yahuwah your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and below earth. Now swear to me by Yahuwah that you will be kind to me and my family since I have helped you. Give me some guarantee that when Jericho is conquered, you will let me live along with my father and mother and my brothers and my sisters and all their families. We offer our own lives as a guarantee for your safety, the man agreed. If you don't betray us, we will keep our promise and be kind to you when Yahuwah gives us this land. Then, since Rahab's house was built into the town wall, she let them down by a rope through the window. Escape to the hill country, she told them. Hide there for three days from the men searching for you. Then, when, you, when they have returned, you can go on your way. Before they left, the men told her, we will be bound by the oath we have taken only if you follow these instructions. When we come into the land, you must leave the scarlet rope hanging from the window through which you let us down. And all your family members, your father, mother, brothers, and all your relatives must be here inside the house. If they go out into the street and are killed, it will not be our fault. But if anyone lays a hand on the people inside of this house, we will accept the responsibility for their death. If you betray us, however, we are not bound by this oath in any way. I accept your terms, she replied, and she went and she sent them on their way, leaving the scarlet rope hanging from the window. The spies went up into the hill country and stayed there three days. The men who were chasing them searched everywhere along the road, but they finally returned without success. Then the two spies came down from the hill country crossed the Jordan River and reported to Joshua all that had happened to them. Yahuwah has given us the whole land. And they said, for all the people in the land are terrified of us. Joshua chapter three. The Israelites crossed the Jordan. Early the next morning, Joshua and all the Israelites left Acacia Grove and arrived at the banks of the Jordan River where they left the camp before crossing. Three days later, the Israelite officers went through the camp, giving these instructions to the people. When you see the Levitical priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant of Yahuwah your God, move out from your positions and follow them. Since you have never traveled this way before, they will guide you. Stay about a half mile behind them, keeping a clear distance between you and the Ark. Make sure you don't come any closer. Then Joshua told the people, Purify yourselves, for tomorrow Yahuwah will do great wonders among you. In the morning, Joshua said to the priest, Lift up the Ark of the Covenant and lead the people across the river. And so they started out and went ahead of the people. Yahuwah told Joshua, Today I will begin to make you a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites. They will know that I am with you, just as, just as I was with Moses. Give this command to the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the banks of the Jordan River, take a few steps into the river and stop there. So Joshua told the Israelites, come and listen to what Yahuwah your God says. Today you will know that the living God is among you. He will surely drive out the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites ahead of you. Look, the Ark of the Covenant, which belongs to the Lord of the whole earth, will lead you across the Jordan River. Now choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. The priests will carry the Ark of Yahuwah, the Lord of all the earth. As soon as their feet touch the water, the flow of water will be cut off upstream and the river will stand up like a wall. How many of y'all know that there was a second sea that was parted, right? We all only hear about the Sea of Reeds or the, the Red Sea. A lot of times if we don't keep reading, we never hear about how the waters parted again, right? So the people left their camps across the Jordan and the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead, went ahead of them. 
It was the harvest season and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the ark touched the water at the river's edge, the water above that point began backing up such a great distance away at a town called Adam, which is near Zarethan. And the waters below that point flowed onto the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. Then all the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. Meanwhile, the priests who were carrying the Ark of Yahuwah's covenant stood on dry ground in the middle of the riverbed as the people passed by. They waited there until the whole nation of Israel had crossed the Jordan on dry ground. Yeah, when I read it, I was like, what? I said, we never heard about this. I mean, we should have. Because we should have been reading it ourselves, right? But we, we weren't. Don't nobody. I ain't gonna say don't nobody because some people really do be reading the Bible, you know. But at that point, I was reading it, but I was I, I lived in the New Testament. All right, beautiful people. So let's hop on over here to the letters of Jews. And we are in volume three. We're starting at chapter six today. <clears throat> We're picking up where we left off on page 354. <clears throat> And no, I'm sorry. Wait, yeah, we started already. Okay, yeah. Page 354. And the title is Balaam with Balak. So remember, we're reading about the expanded story um, about when Balaam, when King Balak sent for Balaam, the role prophet of the heathens, to curse Israel. Remember, Balaam, yeah, Balaam was like, was Moses' peer, right? He was like a great magician. Like he could literally do anything. Even Jonas and John, as a matter of fact, we're going to uh, find it here. Um, and it's going to tell you a portion, like when they were being attacked, how Jonas and John, they also who were great magicians, they <laughs> they flew out of there. Like they literally, y'all see stuff in movies, people be doing magic for real, for real. That, you know, I'm just saying. But what's happening today, people are really kind of adult to some of the things that have happened. And that are happening. TV has kind of dumbed you down. And then a lot of times you aren't exposed to it. You know. And then when you see something. It's like oh my gosh. They're doing a bunch of witchcraft. But if we read early in Mayan scripture. Who had it. And I don't know why they label it that. They just label it that. So it, when you when you hear somebody say it. A lot of people are triggered by it. Right. And when they hear the word magic. It's like oh my god. Get out of here. You know. But who had given. Ten types of magic to all the earth like all the people of the earth was to use it right and we can get into a lot of detail about that but i'm just saying um the egyptians used that's why they could go for for first for the first couple plagues uh they could kind of go toe to toe with moses because of um what they understood about nature that's simply what it is i don't know what i call it magic but if you understand certain things about nature and then for one, if you don't fill your body with garbage, you are you can you are a whole lot more in tune with nature around you and with the spirit of the most holy and with the spirit realm where you can actually see and understand some things. And what people would perceive to be magic is not really magic at all. It's really an understanding of our environment and of the elements and how they can be bent, right? all it is i just want to say that but y'all ain't ready for that and we ain't gonna talk about that here all right balaam with balak whensoever you who wish to humble an evil doer wait hold on we made it yeah okay yeah we sure did because remember we talked about whenever he wishes to humble an evil doer he first exalts him he sets him up for the okie doke the big fall all right but we're going to the section under that Balaam sacrifice refused. Okay. On the following morning, Balaam, Balak took Balaam and bore him up upon into the high places of Baal. For Balak was even a greater magician and soothsayer than Balaam, who, uh, who allowed himself like a blind man to be led by him. He led him to this spot because through his magic lore, he knew that Israel was to suffer great misfortunes. Hold on, wait. Did I write the wrong page number? Hold on. No, okay, it's just repeating something. I was like, I know we read, 
I know I read this sentence over here. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, let me just start over. On the following morning, Balak took Balaam and brought him upon into the high places of Baal. For Balak was even a greater magician and soothsayer than Balaam, who allowed himself like a blind man to be led by him. He led him to this spot because through his magic lore, he knew that Israel was to suffer a great misfortune upon the heights of Baal Peor, and he thought it was to be Balaam's curse that would affect this disaster upon them. The relation of these two men to each other was like that between two men, one of whom has a knife in his hand but does not know what part of the body to strike for slaughter, and the other who knows the parts of the body but has no knife. Listen to that. That you know, I, I kind of just said that in just other words. It's not listen, is having an understanding of nature and the elements and how to bend them, right? So this just gave this example of a man who has, and most of the world is like the man who has a knife but doesn't know where to strike. And it's very few who began to get closer to the most high and understand this environment that we have been set in, who has no knife, but what it says, but knows the parts of the body, right? He can do way more damage than this person with a knife who's just going to start flinging it all willy-nilly. Shalom, jo Joanne. Pray all is well. Join your family. The relation of these two men to each other was like that, was that, was like that between two men one of whom has a knife in his hand but does not know what part of the body to strike for slaughter, and the other knows the part of the body but has no knife. Balak knew the place where disaster awaited Israel but did not know how it, to, it was to be brought about, whereas Balaam knew how evil is conjured up but did not know the places set for disaster to which Balak had led him. Balaam's superiority over Balak and the other magicians lay in this, that he could accurately determine the moment in which Yahuwah is wrathful. And it was for this reason that his curse was always effective because he knew how to curse at the very instance of Yahuwah's anger. It is true that Yahuwah is angry for one instant every day to wit during the third hour of the day when the kings with crowns upon their heads worship the sun. But this moment is of infinite, infinitesimally, what? Infinite, infinitesimally. Listen, I'm going to spell this word for y'all. I-N-F-I-N-I-T-E-S-I-M-A-L-L-Y. I'm going to just replace this word with incredibly, right? Okay. But this moment is in, of incredibly short duration. That's I'm sure that's what it means, just about how it was used and as <laughs> infinite being a part of the word. Okay. Okay. Full 85,088 such moments make an hour so that no mortal save Balaam had ever been able to fix that moment. <clears throat> Although this point of time has its outward manifestations in nature, for while it lasts, the cock's comb becomes absolutely white without even the smallest stripe of red. Yahuwah's love for Israel, however, is so great that during the time that Balaam prepared to curse Israel, he did not wax angry at all, so that Balaam waited in vain for the moment of wrath. Balaam now tried to obtain Jehuah's consent for Israel's curse through sacrifices, and hence bade Balak erect seven altars upon the high place of Baal, corresponding to the seven altars that since Adam had been erected by seven pious men, to wit, Adam, Abel, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses. When the altars had been erected, he said to Yahuwah, Why didst thou favor these people, if not for the sacrifice they offered thee? Were it not better for thee to be adored by seventy nations than by one? 
But the Holy Spirit answered, Better is a dry morsel than quietness therewith than a house full of sacrifices and strife. Dearer to me is a dry offering of meal than all these many flesh offerings by which thou strivest to stir up strife between me and Israel. Now was Balaam's fate decided, for by his conduct he put himself into direct opposition to Yahuwah, and hence his destruction was decreed. And from that moment the Holy Spirit of prophecy left him, and he was nothing more than a magician. For Israel's sake, however, Yahuwah granted him the honor of his revelation, but he did so grudgingly as one loathes to touch an unclean thing. Hence he would not permit Balaam to come to him, but rather appeared to Balaam. Yahuwah's different treatment of Balaam and Moses at the revelation is evident, for whereas the latter betook himself to the sanctuary to hear Yahuwah's words, the former receives Yahuwah's revelation at any place whatsoever. It characterizes Yahuwah's attitude toward them. Two men once knocked at a, at a magnate's door, the one being a friend who had a request to make, and the other a leprous beggar. The magnet said, Let my friend enter, but I shall send the beggar's alms to the door, that he may not enter and pollute my palace. Yahuwah called Moses to him, whereas he did not desire Balaam to come to him, but betook himself there. He found Balaam at the seven altars that he had erected, and said to him, What dost thou hear? Whereupon Balaam answered, I have erected for thee as many altars, as three as the three fathers of Israel, and I have offered upon them bullocks and rams. Yahuwah, however, said to him, Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. Pleasanter to me is the meal of unleavened bread and herbs that the Israelites took in Egypt than the bullocks that thou offerest out of enmity. O thou knave, if I wish for offerings, I will order Michael and Gabriel to bring them to me. Thou art mistaken if thou believest that I should accept offerings from the nations of the world, for I have vowed a vow to accept such from Israel alone. Yahuwah thereupon handed him over to an angel who entered and settled in his throat and would not permit Balaam to speak when he wanted to curse Israel. Balaam extols Israel. Balaam now turned back to Balak, who awaited him with his princes. He now wanted to begin to curse Israel, but his mouth, far from being able to utter the words, was on the contrary compelled to praise and bless Israel. He said, I found myself upon the high places in company with the patriarchs, and thou, Balak, has come down from the heights. Through thee did I lose the gift of prophecy. Both of us are ungrateful men. If we wish to undertake evil against Israel, for had it not been for their father Abraham, for whose sake Yahuwah saved Lot out of the ruined cities, there should be no Balak, for thou art one of Lot's descendants. And had it not been for Jacob, I, Laban's descendants, should not now be here on the earth, for no sons were born unto Laban until after Jacob had come into his house. For thou didst bring me out of Amram to curse Israel, but it was this land that their father Abraham left laden with blessings. And it was this land also that their father Jacob entered laden with blessings. Shall now a curse come upon them from this land? How can I curse them if he that curses them bringing a curse? How can I curse them? If he that curses them bringeth a curse upon, him, upon himself, thou, moreover, wishest me even to curse Jacob. Hadst thou urged me to curse a nation that were only the descendants of Abraham or of Isaac, I might have been able to do so. But to curse Jacob's descendants is as bad as if a man were to become king and to say to him, the crown that thou wearest upon thy head is worthless. <clears throat> Would such a man be permitted to live? Yahuwah's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. In Israel, said Yahuwah, will be glorified. I'm sorry. In Israel, said Yahuwah, will I be glorified? How now shall I curse them? How shall I curse whom Yahuwah has not cursed? 
Even when they have been worthy of a curse, they have not been cursed. When Jacob went in to receive the blessings, he went in through craft and said to his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn. Doth not he deserve a curse out of whose mouth issueth a lie? Yet far from being cursed, he was even blessed. Ordinarily, a legion that stirs up sedition against their king is declared guilty by death. But Israel denied Yahuwah, saying, These be thy gods, O Israel. Should they not then have been destroyed? Yahuwah, however, did not even at that moment withdraw from him, withdraw from them his love, but left them to the clouds of glory, manna, and the well, even after they had adored the calf. Howsoever often they sinned, and Yahuwah threatened them with a curse, still he did not say that he would bring it upon them. Whereas in his promise of blessings, he always tells them that he himself would send them upon Israel. How shall I curse when Yahuwah does not curse? Israel is a nation whom Yahuwah thought even before the creation of the world. Israel is a nation of whom Yahuwah thought even before the creation of the world. It is a rock upon which the world is founded. For when Yahuwah was considering the scheme of the creation, he thought, how can I create the world if the idolatrous generation of Enosh and the generation of the flood will arouse my anger? He was about to desist from the creation of the world when he saw before him Abraham's form. And he said, now I have a rock upon which I can build, one upon which I can found the world. How too shall I curse this nation that are protected and surrounded by the merits of the patriarchs and the wives of the patriarchs, as if by lofty mountains and steep hills, so that if Israel sins, Yahuwah forgives them as soon as Moses prays to him to be mindful of the patriarchs. I was in error when I believed Israel could easily be attacked, but now I know that they have taken deep root in the earth and cannot be uprooted. Yahuwah forgives them many sins out of consideration for their having preserved the token of the Abrahamic covenant. And as powerless as I am to curse them alone, just as powerless as I am to curse them together with another nation. For it is a people that shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Israel is distinguished from all the other nations by their custom, by their food, by the token of the covenant upon their bodies, and by the token upon their doorposts. Wherefore, Yahuwah does not judge them at the same time with the other nations. For he judges the latter in the darkness of the night, but the former in bright daylight. Israel is a separate people alone. They enjoy the blessings Yahuwah gives them. No other nation rejoices with Israel. So too, in the Messianic time, Israel, Israel will quite alone rejoice in delights and pleasures, whereas in the present world, it may also partake of the universal warfare of the nations. I am not able to accomplish anything against this nation that zealously fulfills Yahuwah's commandments and that owes its existence to the, to the devotion with which the wives of the patriarchs obeyed the commandments of Yahuwah. Let me die the death of righteousness. Let my last end be like this. Balaam, in these words, spoke an unconscious prophecy to wit that he should be entitled to participate in the fate of the righteous, to share to his share in the future world. If he died the death of the righteous, a natural death, but not otherwise. He died, however, a violent death, and thus lost his share in the future world. That was so good. If they had just left that portion <laughs> in the canonized, or if they had to canonize that, how Balaam, blessed is right oh that, that was so good i want to read that whole part again but we got to keep moving y'all read it read it on your own or play the video over okay next section balaam's hopes disappointed when balak saw that balaam instead of cursing praised and exalted israel he led him to the top of pisgah hoping that he might there succeed in cursing israel by means of his sorcery balak had discovered that pisgah was to be a place of misfortune for Israel. 
Hence, he thought that Balaam would utter his curse against Israel there. He was, however, mistaken. The disaster that there awaited Israel was the death of their leader Moses, who died there. And Yahuwah refused to grant Balaam's wish on this spot also. Yahuwah indeed appeared to Balaam. But what he said to him was, Go again unto Balak and bless Israel. Balaam now did not wish to return to Balak at all to disappoint him a second time, but Yahuwah compelled him to return to Balak and communicate to him the blessings of Israel. Balaam now turned back to Balak, whom he found standing by his burnt offering. But whereas on the first occasion the king had awaited Balaam, surrounded by all his princes, Balaam now saw only a few notables surrounding Balak. Most of the princes had deserted their king without awaiting Balaam, for they expected nothing further from him after the first disappointment he had caused them. Balak as well did not know now how to receive him as kindly, but mockingly asked, what hath the Lord spoken? Hinting in this way that Balaam was unable to say what he wished, for only what Yahuwah will. I mean, if you know, why you even ask, bro? Like, why are you still there? Balaam replied to these scornful words of Balak. Rise up, Balak. Thou mayest not be seated when Yahuwah's words are spoken. Yahuwah is not like man of flesh and blood that makes friends and disowns them as soon as he finds such are as of better than they. Yahuwah is not so... He doth not cancel the vow he hath made to the patriarchs, for he promised to bestow Canaan upon their descendants, and he fulfilled his promise. He always fulfills what he promised to Israel, but allows the evil with which he threatens them to be unfulfilled as soon as they repent them of their sins. Yahuwah sees not their sins, but he sees their good deeds. Let us remember that, people. Y'all get y'all set into a bit of a pickle into a bit of a pit into a bit of a um bind and you the cause of it you didn't see it just repent wholeheartedly as soon as you realize what you're doing in your moment of insanity just stop it stop it all together repent and turn away from it right and don't go back to it and hopefully you will belay his last on destruction that was heading your way. I'm just saying. Let's just read this again. <clears throat> Hold on. Oh, let's go right here. Balaam replied to these scornful words of Balak. Rise up, Balak. Thou mayest not be seated when Yahuwah's words are spoken. Yahuwah is not like a man of flesh and blood that makes friends and disowns them. As soon as he finds such as are better than they, Yahuwah is not so, for he does not counsel the vow he made to the patriarchs, for he promised to bestow Canaan upon their descendants, and he fulfilled his promise. He always fulfills what he has promised to Israel, but allows the evil with which he threatens them to be unfulfilled as soon as they repent them of their sins. Yahuwah sees not their sins, but he sees their good deeds. But thou, Balak says to me, come curse Jacob for me. But a thief can enter a vineyard that hath a keeper only if the keeper sleeps. And he that keepeth Israel neither sleepeth nor slumbereth. And how then can I enter their vineyard? If however thou dost think I cannot harm Israel on account of Moses, who is their keeper, Know then that his successable will be as invincible as he, for through the sound of trumpets he will overthrow the walls of Jericho. Thou, Balak, furthermore says, as a people have gone forth out of Egypt, but they have not only gone forth, Yahuwah have brought them forth out of Egypt, who combines in himself the powers of the angels and of the invisible demons. Swift as flight of a bird, doth fortune as well as misfortune come upon Israel. If they sin, Yahuwah suddenly plunges them down. But if they act well in the sight of Yahuwah, Yahuwah exalts them as quickly as a cloud. Thou, Balak, has repeatedly tried to discover in what spot thou should be able to work them woe. 
but they will have nothing to do with sorceries. They baffle and put to naught the sorceries and prophecies of other nations by their pious deeds. When they set forth into battle, they practice no magic. But the high priest, clad in the Urim and the Tumen, consults Yahuwah about the outcome of the battle. There will even be a time when Israel will sit before Yahuwah like a pupil before his master and will receive the revelation of the secrets of the Torah from him so that even the angels will consult Israel concerning the secrets revealed to them by Yahuwah. For the angels are not permitted to approach Yahuwah as closely as the Israelites in the Messianic time. Yeah. Yes, boy. All right. I want. I hungry. Okay, I'm give me a few minutes. Do you want some video? Uh, not yet. Give me a few minutes. I'm almost done. I want cereal. Okay, Josh, can you go ahead and have that? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. All right. No, so remember, remember, remember these very, very important points. Yahuwah, listen, remember, let's go back to Moses being compared or Balaam being compared to Moses, right? Although some manuscripts from other nations call, call Moses this great magician, Moses only acted when he consulted Yahuwah and he performed signs and wonders, right? The latter, Balaam, he just performed because he understood he performed them at his own will. And it said he performed no kind deed. So when Yahuwah begins to reveal things to you and how things work, especially things that could destroy, you are not free to use them at will. You are only to use them as you consult the Most High, right? Because he's our mighty one. He's the one who leads and guides us, right? Look, hold on, let me go back up here where it says... Uh, right here thou Balak has repeatedly tried to discover in what spot thou should be able to work them woe but they would have nothing to do with sorceries they baffle and put to naught the sorceries and the prophecies of other nations by their pious deeds like i all that we know how these things work we have no need to use these things let's use the I call it the 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 back door route to cause things to happen because Yahuwah said if you would just keep my commands, I would be so all good things upon you, right? Yes, baby girl. Joshua, yes. Okay, Joshua's about to make you something. Josh, come here, please. And that's why it says shalom, shalom, Kathy. And so you know in the scripture where it says, "Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live among you." It is because when you when you when you actually seek them out. Israel, other nations do that. Like they go to crystal ball readers and uh, whatever. Yahuwah said, my people are not to do that because you ought to come to me. You don't need to go to a person to have your palms read and all this. And he said, I will reveal that stuff to you directly. That's why he got pissed with people among us who did it. Because what happens? People's attention begins to be diverted from you. Who you begin to turn people's hearts away from him. And now when they get into a bind of things happening, they need to know the next best thing that's gonna happen. They're seeking out this soothsayer or this per person who knows how to perform these things, but they should have turned them away. You know, you know, you need to go seek the most holy about that. You know, I ain't telling you nothing. Not unless he tell me tell you something. Like people shouldn't even know for real that you know those things unless Yahuwah has revealed <laughs> to whatever like he did with Moses, right? Like that's so that's why that was such a bad thing because people get their eyes off of the most holy and they begin to look at these people like they're like they are like they are gods, right? Because they have knowledge that most of the world doesn't have, you know, and a lot of time it's not so much. And sometimes it is, but they simply understand elements and how they can be bent, right? Okay, I just want to say that. Thou, Balak, has repeatedly tried to discover in what spot thou shouldest be able to work them well, but they will have nothing to do with sorceries. They baffle and put to naught the sorceries and prophecies of other nations by their pious deeds. When they set forth into battle, they practice no magic. But the high priest clad in the urine and the tumen, remember, I wish I had it down here. I normally keep it on me. 
um, but it was two stones. We talked about this before. The urine and the tumen is the two stones that the priest put inside of there. It was like this little pocket that the priest put inside of that was behind the breastplate with all the 12 stones that represented each tribe, right? And the first one who had a urim and a tumen is Enoch, right? And I know that from other manuscripts. Matter of fact, the Book of Remembrance has it in there how the first urim and a tumen was given to Enoch by Yahuwah and how it was created, right? I'm like, oh, snap. So listen, okay. When they set forth in battle, they practiced no magic, but the high priest clad in the Urim and the Tumen consulted Yahuwah about the outcome of the battle, right? They consulted Yahuwah about the outcome, not the witches and the sorcerers and all these people who understand things, but you, you see a little bit, but you don't see everything. That's why Israel alone is to consult Yahuwah on every single thing. I know I keep busting in saying this because I can't say it enough. I can't say it enough. Like, listen, when I was younger, I got a little story, right? Real quick. When I was younger, I was in high school. You know how they show, like, the psychic commercials that come on TV and stuff, right? Now, mind you, I had always been a dreamer, you know, but it, it used to, I'm like, how in the world can Miss, how in the world can Miss Clara, you know, they got different names, Miss Clarice or Miss Clara or Barbara. They, it's, it's always seemed to be their names. They got crystal ball readings and stuff. And then every time these commercials would be on, it would really catch my attention. I'm like, they lie. They ain't gonna be able to say that. So what I did one night, <laughs> where everybody was asleep, I waited till everybody in the house went to sleep. And I got on the phone. I had wrote down the number. I think it was 1 800 tell me my future or something like that. I know that's long, but I forget what the number was, but y'all know how to be doing them. Uh, special phone numbers like 1-800-CALL-ME or something like that. But anyway, it was something like that. But anyway, I wrote down the number and I called it. Matter of fact, I called it, I called it twice. I called it twice. I called it late one night and then I got scared and hung up. And then the next day after my mom had went to work when she wasn't in the house, I decided to call it back. I remember we were standing on Marlowe Avenue in Illinois in Kentucky. Listen, I called her and they do their little open and stuff. I was like, hello, yes. Um, and my mama probably found out, although she never said anything to me about it because it would have popped up on the phone bill. Maybe she just wasn't paying attention to the phone bill that month, but she never said anything to me, which probably said she didn't pay attention, look really close at the phone bill, right? So I called, I was like, um, yeah, I saw this commercial. I think I was like 16 years old. I saw this commercial on TV that this woman could tell me my future. And I just, I just wanted to see what she had to say about me. And so she said, yes, baby. So I see, hold on, let me pull my cards and stuff. And I remember, I remember it. She said, okay, I see this and I see this. Like this woman told me about my husband, which was my boyfriend at the time. I'm like, oh. she told me about my daddy. And I'm like, oh. And I'm like, and I hung up the phone, right? And I'm like, I'm like, God, you told this woman this? <laughs> listen, at that time, because, listen, I grew up in the church, right? So anything supernatural that happened, I always, I always considered it to be from you. Who I never once in my young mind ever thought that she could be pulling information from the other side, right? It never once, so it just shocked the crap out of me. I never did it again because I thought, surely this is true. And Yahuwah then told this woman, I would call him God at the time. God then told this woman this. So when she started saying that stuff, I just hung up the phone because I didn't know how deep she was going to get. I didn't know she was going to go in and be like, I know you're having sex and I'm going to call your mama because I, you can call me now. I got all the information. I didn't. I'm thinking she pinpointed those couple things. Clearly, she could see everything about my life from things I was doing on down low. And not down low, but being a sneaky teenage girl. I ain't, you know, nothing crazy, but it was crazy because I shouldn't have stomped there. <laughs> I was young. I was, you know, I wasn't promiscuous, but it was just me and my boyfriend, right? But those things right there. And I'm like, <gasps> you know, so when I read about these things, I'm like, father, but how do they, if it's not you 
telling them this. How do they even know this? Now, as I get older, I understand this information <laughs> can be given to you from fallen angels or you, people call them demons. You, you tap into that side and it will be accurate information. It will be accurate information, but they don't have the authority to give you everything. And they don't tell you the destruction that's coming from you seeking them, right? We are not to do that. Look, when I got older and I realized what I had did by going to a, I just said going to a witch or going to a crystal ball reader, Sue said, you who said, this is forbidden. And this was even before he started waking me up. But as I started reading a little bit, and even again, when he started waking me up, I'm like, Father, just in case that prayer didn't work, then when I said it, let me repent again. I'm sorry for doing this. And it's in my mama house. Like I'm starting to repent from sins from the time that I, I can consciously remember I was sitting, right? So I was like, any kind of curse that may have come on me and my family for me calling this crystal ball reader on that that, that psychic hotline. Father, forgive me. You know, so I when I think about it now, I laugh, but that's a very, very serious offense. Why? Because had I been taken and captivated and wanted to know more, it could have completely led me away from the Most High, and I would have been seeking a woman, calling psychic hotlines just to get a fix on how my next thing going to go. And some people live that way. It has to be horrible. You know, you who doesn't want us living that way? He said, come to me only. And he said, these people that do this among you, they got to go. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live among you right? They turn our hearts away, people. They turn our hearts away from the most holy. That's the biggest thing. You know, granted, they have information and you're going to let them go on doing it too. For whatever reason, that's his thing, whatever. He going, whatever. But we are not to go to them, right? Okay, I just want to say that. Okay, I'm going to keep reading. Where are we at? 51 minutes. Okay, I'll just go back up there again. Thou, Bailey, has repeatedly <clears throat> tried to discover in what spot thou shouldest be able to work them well, but they will have nothing to do with sorceries. They baffle and put to naught the sorceries and the prophecies of other nations by their pious deeds. When they set forth into battle, they practice no magic, but the high priest, clad in the Urim and the Tumen, consults Yahuwah about the outcome of the battle. There will even be a time when Israel will sit before Yahuwah like a pupil before his master and will receive the revelation of the secrets of the Torah from him so that even the angels will consult Israel concerning the secrets revealed to them by Yahuwah. For the angels are not permitted to approach Yahuwah as closely as the Israelites in the Messianic time. There is not indeed upon the earth a nation like Israel. The last thing they do before going to sleep is to devote themselves to the study of the Torah and the fulfillment of its laws. And this is also their first occupation upon awakening. As soon as they arise, they recite the Shema and adore Yahuwah. And not until after they have done this do they go about their business. If evil spirits come to attack them or if disaster threatens them, they worship their God. And as soon as they utter the words, Yahuwah our God is one God, the harmful spirits become powerless against them and whisper after them the words, praise be the name of the glory of his kingdom forever and ever. When at night they retire, they again recite the Shema, whereupon the angels of the day pass on the trust of guarding them to the angels of the night. And when upon awakening, awakening they again worship their Lord, the angels of the night again pass them on to be guarded by the angels of the day. Oh, y'all better learn that shimmer. <laughs> when Balak and teach it to your children. When Balak for a second time saw that Balaam, instead of cursing, blessed Israel, he brought him to the top of Peor, thinking that peradventure it would please you to have him curse them from thence. For by this sorcery, Balak had discovered that a great disaster was to fall upon Israel on the top of Peor and thought that this disaster might be their curse from Balaam. He was, however, mistaken in this supposition, for in the disaster in that spot was none other than Israel's sin with the daughters of Moab and Yahuwah's punishment for this. Curses turn to blessing. Read this next section. Balaam, on the other hand, made no further attempts to induce 
Yahuwah to curse Israel, but thought he might be able to bring misfortune upon Israel by enumerating the sins they had committed in the desert, and in this way conjure up Yahuwah's wrath against them. But the desert had also been the place where Israel had accepted the Torah. Hence, the mention of the desert called up Yahuwah's love instead of his wrath. Balaam himself, when he let his eyes wander over to the camp of Israel, perceived how their tents were so pitched that no one might see what was going on in the homes of the others, found himself compelled to burst into praises of Israel. And under the inspiration of the prophetic spirit, the curses he had intended to speak were changed in his mouth into blessings, and he spoke to the extent and, and he spoke to the extent and importance of the kingdom of Israel. But whereas Moses blesses his people in a low, quiet voice, Balaam spoke his words of blessing in a very loud voice, so that all the other nations might hear and out of envy make war upon Israel. Balaam's blessings were therefore accounted to him not as blessings, but as curses. Yahuwah said, I have promised Abraham, and I, will and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curse thee. Hence will I account Balaam's blessings as curses. And indeed, all of Balaam's blessings later turned to curses, except his blessings that houses of teachings and a prayer should never be missing among Israel. The words of Balaam announced were heard by all the inhabitants of, our earth, of the earth. Such power did Yahuwah lend. The words that Balaam announced were heard by all the inhabitants of the earth. Such power did Yahuwah lend to his voice. For he knew that at some future time there would be born of a woman. Hold on. For he knew that at some future time there would be a man born of a woman who would pass himself for a god and would mislead the world. The words that Balaam announced were heard by all the inhabitants of the earth. Such power did Yahuwah lend to his voice, for he knew that at some future time there would be a man born of a woman who would pass himself for a god and would mislead the world. Yep, now we know who that is, Trina. That's why I read it again. I didn't even say I was going to read it again. I just paused and read it again. Let that sink down in your sha na na. Hence, Yahuwah permitted all the world to hear Balaam's words that said, Yahuwah is not a man, and the man that passeth himself for God lieth. Hence, Yahuwah permitted all the world to hear Balaam's words that said, Yahuwah is not a man, and the man that passeth himself for God lieth. But he that will mislead the world by declaring that he will disappear for a time and then reappear will promise what he can never fulfill. Whoa, what was this book written? Yeah, that's what I thought. 1909. But we also know that this was, this was compiled from older manuscripts. Ugh. Yeah, okay. But he that will mislead the world by declaring that he will disappear for a time and then reappear will promise what he can never fulfill. I guess we see why this part wasn't canonized, huh? Yeah. But he that will mislead the world by declaring that he will disappear for a time and then reappear will promise what he can never fulfill. Woe then to that nation that will lend ear to the man who will pass himself for God. 
Oh, my gosh. Balaam furthermore announced the events that will come to pass at the time of David's sovereignty and also what will happen at the end of days and the time of Messiah when Rome and all other nations will be destroyed by Israel, excepting only the descendants of Jethro who will participate in Israel's joy and sorrows. And let me just reiterate something again. When we see this say in the time of the Messiah, right? Let us realize that we're talking about Israel's Messiah. Who is Israel's Messiah? Yahuwah himself is Israel's Messiah. What does Yahuwah do when he delivers his people? When he is doing his Messiah things, right? He raises up someone among that current generation to fulfill what he is going to do, i.e. Moses, i.e. Ruth i.e. Nehemiah. And I could just keep and on and on. Woe be to the man who passes himself off as God. He is making a promise he can never fulfill. He is leading the whole world astray. Yea, the Kenites are to be the ones to announce to Israel the arrival of the Messiah and the sons of the Kenite Jonadab are to be the first at the time of the Messiah to bring the offerings at the temple and to announce to Jerusalem its deliverance. This was Balaam's last prophecy. After this, the prophetic spirit left Balaam and Yahuwah in this way granted Moses wish. Hey, shush, y'all, chill. And Yahuwah in this way granted Moses' wish to reserve the gift of prophecy as a special distinction to Israel. Balaam was the last prophet of the nations, or shall we say the last prophet of the heathen nations. So we got people calling themselves prophets who are not of Israel, and we know who Israel is. Israel looks like me, but not all those who look like me is Israel, but Israel looks like me, right? Some of us a little lighter, some of us a little darker, right? The gift of prophecy is only given to Israel. It's only given to us. Anybody of another nation who is prophesying is not being given prophecies from Yahuwah. He has made that clear. In the Old Testament, and even through some of the manuscripts that we are reading. So we can look at some of these prophets of the other nations. Their last true prophet was Balaam, right? That's what it said. Their last true prophet was Balaam. That's when the spirit of prophecy was taken from the heathen nations at his death. Matter of fact, before he died, the spirit of prophecy was taken from him. And the other nations, they prophesy, they just like them, them crystal ball readers and them soothsayers. They getting information, and the information they telling you is sure it's looking like their prophecies are coming to pass. But when you look at it from Yahuwah's standpoint, and you get it from Israel, you will begin to see their prophecies are not really prophecies at all. That's why even over this last year, even before all of this big all of these big shenanigans and government with the last president and new president before uh before voting day. I was mentioned, so I was like, what y'all think? Because I saw it. I'm like, oh, oh, I'm like, Father, what about all these prophecies from these prophets? Kim Clement and all these. He's like, hmm, what I tell you? I'm like, oh shoot. And I made a mention of it. And I mean, I think it was October the 9th was the first time I publicly said something. And I made a post about it. And I said, the current king will not be the next king. <laughs> I said, remember I told y'all this. And what happened? Boom, and all these shenanigans broke out. I'm like, Father, you are true. Let you be true and every man be a liar. And that's when I began to realize that all the prophecies from the other nations, that there was a major shift taking place in this world. And their prophecies are beginning to fall. They are backpedaling forward peddling, doing whatever they can to keep all kind of credibility and everything that they keep saying out of their mouth keep hitting the ground. Bruh, I'm like, people? And what saddens me is that a lot of Israel that don't know that they're Israel is being taken by the prophecies of the other nations who are called well-known prophets, names and likes. 
Okay, we done for the day. We done for the day. We'll pick this up tomorrow. It's Monday. And everybody got to get to work if they work in today. But we're going to stop right there. We'll pick. I was going to read this next section, but we'll do it tomorrow because we doing a week that I'm trying. I'm going to try and keep it like at an hour, if not just a little bit under it. So, but all right, y'all. So that was Legends of Jews started on page 354. 354. Let's say four. And we ended on page 358, which we'll pick back up tomorrow. And we start in the book of Joshua. The first chapter is one, two, and three. It is Monday, March the 1st, 2021, day 90 of year three of reading through the books of the law and the prophets and of the three consecutive day count, day 759. Remember that it's without the feast days or the Sabbath feast days added in. Why? Because we rest. All right, beautiful people. So let's go ahead and close this out with the blessing. Remember, y'all need to learn that blessing and the shimmer by heart, people. Learn by heart. You ain't, you ain't just read it every day. Read it. Every, just open up your Bible and read it. If you can't recite it, just open it up and read it. Ain't no shame if, if you read it. Just read it. Hold it to the dog. Let's know we ain't finished yet. Chill. She's trying to stop the video. I'll let you know when to pull the plug, B. All right. The blessing is found in Numbers, y'all know, chapter 6, verses 22 through 27. Remember, the Nazarite vow is the first 21 verses, and everybody should consider these once in their life, taking the Nazarite vow. Smart girl. Listen, listen, listen. We can play with this in a minute. Hold on. All right. Shh, shh, shh. And Yahuwah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his sons, saying, On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, May Yahuwah bless us and keep us. May Yahuwah make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May Yahuwah lift up his countenance upon us and give us his peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. All right, beautiful people, we're about to get out of here because she's ready to start, ready to start touching stuff and playing with my hair. All right, y'all. Love y'all. See y'all bright and early in the morning, 7, 15, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Bye. Peace. And I already checked. Ain't no questions. See you in the morning. Hi, hi. <laughs> you didn't get me one. Hold on, let me end this one. Bye, y'all. Peace.